Hello and welcome to this video. Now in this video we're going to talk a little bit about objects in JavaScript and reference types in general but we're also going to talk a little bit about strings which in JavaScript uh, inhabit this curious space where they're a primitive type but you can uh, do various object like things with them. Uh, now rather than uh, going to custom little coding environments inside this slide deck what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to hit Control shift i and just open up the browser's develop development tools uh, over here so that I can start uh, typing JavaScript directly into the browser and have it evaluated there and then. So let's get started. Now I would like to begin by getting you to imagine that you are in one of those childhood metaphysical conversations that children sometimes have and someone has asked you the kind of slightly sci-fi question of um, suppose someone was able to duplicate you copy all of your atoms so that um, right next to you there would be standing a copy of you the same right down to the atom would that copy be you this is one of those metaphysical physical debates that um, that children sometimes get into now I don't want to go on to the um, the metaphysics of this in this one um, but what I would like to do is look at this from a little bit of a computer science perspective and ask, uh, well, if I was to point an arrow at you, would that arrow be pointing at your clone? Probably not. If I was then to pour some pink hair dye on your head, would your clone's hair go pink? Um, now, once again, this isn't really to discuss the metaphysics of it. This is as a a, as, a, as a little bit of an introduction to the difference between um, identity and equality for reference types. Uh, so the types that we have seen in JavaScript so far have tended to be things like number and one is equal to one and uh, true is equal to true and we're pretty happy with that and we kind of think okay if I say let a equals one and let b equal to one um, then even though those are two copies of one held at different locations in memory, we're fairly happy with the idea that A equals equals B. They're both one, and it doesn't matter if they're different copies of one. Um, it's not the same, however, for reference types. For reference types, we have instead a reference to an item in memory. So let me say, let A be an object that has the name property Algernon. And let me say that B is an object that has the name property Algernon. And so now let me ask you the question, is A B? And so if we were comparing by value, we might say, well, yes, they are both objects that has the name property Algernon. But these are references to different items in memory. They're references to different items in memory that just happen to have the same content. And so if I was to ask JavaScript, is A equal, equal to B? It would say, no, they are not references to the same item. They're different items in memory. And so if I was to go B.name and update that property to be algae, and I was to print out a.name, a.name would not have changed. I have modified the object B, uh, the object that B refers to, I should say, in memory, but I have not modified the object that A refers to in memory. If, however, I wanted A equals equals B to come true, well, what, one of the things I could do is I could say, no, 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 I am going to point B to A. I'm going to assign the reference B to point to the object that A is referring to. And so now if I have a look at A, it says an object whose name is Algernon. If I ask it about B, it's an object whose name is Algernon, but more importantly, it's the same object whose name is Algernon. And so if I go A equals equals B, it will say true. Those now refer to the same item in memory. And if I was to say B.name is algae this time, then sure enough, B.name is algae but so is a.name because b and a pointed to the same item in memory and I have just updated that item. 
Um, so that is to try and give you this uh, this distinction between uh, well primitive types and reference types or value types and reference types. Now in JavaScript, the only kind of equality that we have for objects is reference equality. Um, in other languages, there's, it's a little bit more nuanced. But the, um, the, the point I'd like to go via next, though, is that, well, it's very easy for us to decide, are these variables pointing to an item? Are they pointing to the same item? The concept of whether the content has the same value could be harder to define, and it could depend on how we want to model it. Uh, so I'm going to give you this very abstract example of suppose we were modeling a deck of cards and I have an ace of diamonds on the left and I have an ace of diamonds on the right. Ignoring for a moment reference equality, the kind of equality that JavaScript does, where I'll say, no, 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 those are different items in memory. If you are implementing a game, would you want to consider the ace of diamonds on the left as being equal to the ace of diamonds on the right? And often... The answer will be, well, we, yes, this is a game and that's Ace of Diamonds and I want to do something on the Ace of Diamonds. I, I don't really mind which Ace of Diamonds it is if I put two decks together. But on the other hand, if I was doing a magic trick, pick a card, any card, is this your card, sir? Um, then I might care and I might want the, um, the, the, the contestant to be able to sign the card. And so in that case, I might want to consider one Ace of Diamonds as being very different than another Ace of Diamonds. Um, so equality for reference types can be harder to define sometimes because it's it depends on what we, what we want to do with it. Now, in terms of languages, different languages treat this in different ways. Um, in Java and in Scala, you can define what equality means for an object. And the way that you do that is that for a particular class of object, you can define a function, a method called equals that will define what equals means for this class of object. The languages can differ quite a bit in how this works. So for instance, in Java, that changes what happens if you say a dot equals of b, but it doesn't change what happens if you say a equals equals b. Uh, a equals equals b is still reference equality. In the language Scala, however, defining this equals method also changes how the equals equals operator works. So there can be differences between languages with it. Um, JavaScript, the language that we're using, doesn't have a mechanism for comparing objects by their content. Um, there are some libraries that can do this for you if you want to do it. Uh, one of the most common ones is a library called Lodash. And so if you bring in, if you load the Lodash script into your program or into your web page, uh, one of the methods that it provides is this one called is equal, where you can pass is equal uh, to objects A and B, and it will perform a deep inspection of their content in order to work out whether or not they are the same. Um, and there is a, uh, a function that can be customized for comparing these values uh, as, as well. And so that starts to provide that capability of defining what equals rather than reference quality uh, means for these items. But JavaScript doesn't have it natively. Natively, A equals equals B is are they pointing to the same item in memory? OK, let's keep on going. Now, I've talked a little bit about value types and reference types. Uh, so which ones are which? Well, the ones that we've seen mostly so far. Um, so, you know, true is true regardless of, sorry, true double equals. I can't assign true to be true. Um, true is true regardless of whether it's the same or a different true in memory. Uh, so the primitive types like booleans and numbers and undefined and null, those are compared by value. Objects, as we've discussed, those are compared by whether the references point to the same item. Strings are this kind of curious case that sits a little bit in the middle between value types and reference types. They're actually a primitive type that is wrapped up to make it behave somewhat reference-like. Now, strings are still compared by value. So if I was to say, let A equals the string Algernon, let B equal the string Algernon, then it doesn't matter if these are different copies of the string Algernon in memory. JavaScript will say they are the same. They are the string Algernon and strings are compared by value. However, 
in some other ways, strings can be treated a little bit like objects. One of these is that we can call methods on them. Um, so for instance, I could ask it Algernon dot to uppercase. Now you'll notice that uppercase, I put these parentheses here, but I've not put an argument inside the brackets there. To uppercase is a method. It is a function that belongs to this string and so it's going to operate on this string. It might take other arguments as well, but this is this string's to uppercase method. And when I hit enter, it's going to give me this string in uppercase. Um, I can also ask various properties about strings. So I can say, Algernon, what is your length property? Only these aren't quite properties like we'll see for a lot of other objects, in that although the syntax would let me assign a value to it. I can go algernon dot length equal four and it, JavaScript's not thrown in errors. It's been perfectly happy. I can't actually update the value. If I go and ask it, what is algernon dot length? It's going to say, no, 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 it's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is the length property uh, of that primitive string algernon. Um, so this is what I mean about them inhabiting a kind of curious in-between space uh, in JavaScript. Now, some things that we can do with strings. Well, we've seen that one is less than two. We can also see that Algernon is less than Bertie. And so this looks like alphabetical order. It's actually alphanumeric order. If I go Algernon is less than lowercase Algernon, I will also get true. And the reason I'll get true is because capital letters come before lowercase letters. That includes if I go um, Algernon is less than Algernon. This capital O comes before that lowercase a. And so alphanumerically, these, uh, this one on the left is still al uh, alphanumerically before this one on the right. Um, it does let us do things like insert numbers. So Algernon 1 is less than Algernon 2. Uh, longer strings are after shorter strings. So if I go uh, that way around, I'll get false. But if I was to go Algernon is less than Algernon 1, I would get true. So that is an alphanumeric ordering, and I can do those sorts of comparisons on strings. Um, in terms of uh, methods, however, we might want to do the slice method. If I go slice of 1 and minus 1, you can see that what I've done is I've sliced the beginning and the end off. So slice goes, where would you like to go from? Where would you like to go to? If I use a positive number, it will count from the beginning. So slice of one goes zero, one. You want from this L onwards. The negative number at the end goes zero, one. All right, you went to everything up to and not including the last N. And so if I was to go minus two, I'd not be O off the end, etc. Uh, if I was to give it a positive number at the end, well, it would count from the beginning. And so slice 1, comma, plus 7 goes, well, you want from 0, 1 to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So everything up to and not including that last n, because that's um, the element uh, th that is the character at position 7. Um, I mentioned character at. Well, yep, we can ask it. What is the character at zero? And we should get a capital A. At one is the L. So strings are zero indexed. The first element, well, is actually the zeroth element. Um, so that is the zeroth element. That is element one uh, up to the uh, last element. Uh, I can also access that using square brackets, treating a string as if it is a sequence of characters. Another one that may be useful for you, if I was to go hello world and I was to say I would like you to split that on the space, then I will get an array, we'll see arrays a bit more in a moment, uh, containing two elements, the string hello and the string world. If I was to go hello there world unsurprisingly I get an array of three elements uh, so each element that was each side of the space 
Uh, one other common one that you might want to do with that, let me do a multi-line string. Let me go let s equals, and I'm going to use a backtick, uh, and I'm going to say hello there, hit enter, my name is Will, enter, and this is a multi-line string. Close the string. S says undefined because I've just done a definition. If I evaluate S, there it is. And you'll see in the short form, um, as it's just printing it out as a hint, you'll see this little um, left, uh, left pointing arrow. That is to show that there is a new line character here. So in lots of computer programming uh, languages, the way it splits up a string is that there is a special invisible character inside that string, which is the new line character. And if there is an invisible character called the new line character in there, I should be able to split on it, and I can. So I can go s dot split, and if I go backslash n, that means I want you to split on the special character new line. And so then I get an array of three elements, each of which is the lines of that string. So that's quite a common one that um, that people might find find themselves using. Uh, we will meet a little bit more about these multi-line strings. Well, this is actually the template literal syntax, and we could do a bit more with it than that. So let's go on to template literals. Suppose I would like to say, let day equal Wednesday. Suppose I would like to say that I would like to let the date be the 15th. Over here, I've put it as a string. Here, I'll actually put it as a number. Suppose I would like to log to the console a string containing those. So let's go console.log. Let's go backtick to produce a template literal. And then I can start typing a string, but I can also insert little expressions into that string. So I can say, I would like you to insert an expression that evaluates to whatever day is. And then I would like you to insert an expression that evaluates to whatever date is, and then put the th on the end. And when I log that, I get today is Wednesday the 15th. Um, so it has inserted the values day and date for me. Um, that can be very, very useful when I'm writing a program and I'm trying to debug it. I can console.log and I don't just have to log values to the console. I can format them into strings and make, make my life easier by making it easier for me to pro as a programmer to read what I'm writing out as debug comments. OK, let's keep going. So when I did split, I introduced the idea of an array. Uh, so let's show arrays a little bit more formally. Uh, so here I have an example of, array, of an array, and I've created this as a literal array. I would like the array with these particular entries. And so now days contains an array of seven entries numbered zero to six with Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So this is a list of contiguous items held in memory. If I want to reference one of them, I can use square brackets for that. I can go days of zero and I'll get Sunday. Zero indexed. First, the, the, the beginning of the array, the zeroth element is Sunday. Uh, that means that also uh, days of six, uh, sorry, days, day still contained Wednesday. Um, days of six uh, contains this element here, Saturday. But days.length, you'll notice, is seven. Uh, so in an array, it's kind of worth remembering that days of days.length minus one is the last element. Um, sorry, days of days.length. Again, I was doing Wednesday.length before because I still had the value Wednesday in, in the variable day instead of days. I should be more careful with that. So, so here I have the array and I've looked up the um, the element at that array dot length minus one and it will give me the last element from the array. Okay, let's keep going. We've seen before, so let's just print out there. There is my array days, and we've done C style for loops before. So let me use a C style for loop and let me go for let i equals zero, and I want to go up to the situation where i is smaller than days.length because I want to capture uh, the one where i is 6, the last element, but when i is 7, when it's equal to days.length, I don't want to run the loop. And then I want to go i++ plus plus to move on to the next one. 
And so what I would like to do in here is I would like to go console.log days of i. And so that is going to loop through printing out all those elements. If I'd like, I can update all those elements. So I could take this bit of code and I could say, well, what I would like to do is I would like to say days of i, that element, I would like to make it equal to, to assign it to, well, what's in days of i at the moment? And because that's going to come back as a string, let me call to uppercase on the string. And so that has now gone through the entire array, getting each element, turning it to uppercase, reassigning that one into that bit of the array, and then printing it out. And we can see that this has changed the content of that array. These entries are now all in uppercase, whereas they were in mixed case beforehand. Um, there is another way that I could loop through this array. So in JavaScript, there is a, a special notation for of that works on iterable objects like arrays. And so I could say for const day of days, and what I would like to do is go console.log of day. And so that has now looped through printing out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This const here isn't strictly needed. I could omit it and just say for day of days. It can be useful to put the const in there because it can be a little bit of a reminder um, that this is just a local variable. It's not going to actually change what is, you know, if, if I mutate that variable, and so uh, let me say, because at the moment they're all in uppercase, let me say day equals um, day dot to lowercase. And so we'll notice this loops through and it can, can gets the day and it converts it to lowercase and it prints it out, but it doesn't update the day in the array. If I print out days and have a look at the content of it, no, no, the array still has them all in uppercase. Uh, this was a local variable that got assigned to the value in each element. And I then turned the local variable to lowercase, but I didn't actually change the content of the array. Let's keep going. Some other useful arrays method, me, array methods. Well, we saw how we could slice strings. We can slice days as well. So if I go days slice, one comma minus one, I now have knocked one off the beginning and one off the end. And so I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, Sunday and Saturday have disappeared. Now, something to notice. You'll notice that now in this array that has been returned, Monday is associated with the key zero. So it's not that it has taken sun, sat, um, Sunday and Saturday off, but remembered what keys the other bit ones were responding to. Instead, it has returned me a new array containing the elements omitting one from the beginning and one from the end. And so that is the array of five elements, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And in that array that has been returned, Monday is the zeroth element because it is the, the beginning of that array. Um, you'll also notice that days.slice has not altered the original array. It's returned me a new array with this content. So if I print out days again, um, if I just get it to evaluate that at the console, we can see that the days variable, well, that array still has Sunday and Saturday in it. Uh, instead, it's given me a new array that is this slice of the data here. OK, let's keep going. Let's do one that will update the array. Let's go days dot push and let's invent the eighth day of the week, Octoday. And so now that has returned the new length of the array. That array is now eight elements long. And if I have a look at the element at length minus one, seven, it's Octoday. If I go and have a look at days, we can see there it is sitting at the end. Seven is Octoday. The opposite of push is pop. Now, if I was to go, let's go let O, let's put it into a variable. Let's go days.pop. Then what days.pop is going to give me back is the element that it pops off the end. And so now Octoday has popped off and it's been put into 
the uh, variable O. And if I have a look at the days array, you will notice that last element is no longer there. Oxidase has been pulled off that uh, that array of days. Um, there's a few other ones. So if I go days.reverse, that will give me the list in the backwards order. So now Saturday first, going back down to Sunday. Uh, but that one, you'll notice, uh, returns me a... Um, uh, that one there. Uh, oh, sorry, that one has altered uh, the content of the list. And we can see now Sunday is at element uh, six. Uh, let's go days.reverse again and put it back into the original order. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so sometimes it's worth looking up um, when you're using a function, whether it is going to return you a new array containing some contents or whether it's actually going to mutate the array, change the contents of the array. Um, there's lots more me useful methods available on um, uh, the MDN documentation, Mo Mozilla uh, Documentation Network. Um, uh, sorry, Mozilla De Development no uh, Network, uh, Web Docs. Um, it's not always super easy to read, but if you go down here, you can start seeing, OK, here are some of the methods, like last index of, and there, well, there's pop and push and there's slice, uh, but there's quite a lot of other methods that are defined on things that are arrays. Let's keep going. Okay, so far I have shown you one-dimensional arrays, so that is a flat list. Sometimes we might want to have data that is in a higher dimensionality, and so the example I'm going to suggest here is if we look at the tiles on the background of the lava maze, uh, well, there's two dimensions to them. It's like there's there's a, a there, there's rows of stuff, uh, but there's also columns uh, of of the rows, and so this is like two dimensional data. Now, I'm not going to show it with actual tiles in the Lava Maze game, uh, but what I am going to say is that we can define a two dimensional array by defining an array of arrays. So let's just copy that grid over here, and we can see that well, grid itself is an array. And it's an array, each of whose entries is an array. And so that is going to let me do something a little bit like having two dimensional data. And so if I wanted to get out the first uh, row uh, of that grid, I go grid of zero. And well, there is the first row of that grid. Uh, if I wanted to get uh, the X, well, that is the, uh, sorry, the zeroth entry. Uh, in the zeroth row. So let me go grid of zero. And so that's giving me the first row. And let me now index the zeroth entry in that. And that's giving me the x. If I go zero and then get the one, that'll give me the hash that's next along. So that's this hash here. Whereas if I change the first one, if I go to the next row, then we'll see I get this dot here. So when I'm doing it like this, one of the things that's kind of sometimes useful to remember is if we've laid it out like this, um, where uh, our outermost one uh, array contains arrays of rows, uh, then this first one here, I'm actually going down the row. So I'm kind of doing the y axis. Um, and so if over here, when I console.log grid two, three, and it comes out h, well, that is 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3 is why we're getting that H. Um, now, beforehand, I mentioned that uh, you could also do things with uh, string dot split. And so sure enough, I, I could. I could go let S equal to, let's go, um, and let me put... Uh, Ooh, let's put ats in the in the in the last one with maybe a seven, and let's close that multi-line string. And so there is my uh, multi-line string looking well, actually a little bit ragged. I didn't quite type the right numbers, did I? I'm not sure. But I could now go well. Let me go s dot split on that new line character, and now I have. Um, well, I've got now an array that has three of these. And if I wanted, I could go, well, s dot split, and let's have a look um, at element one in that. And so now we've got this string here. And I could actually just index directly into that string if I wanted. I could go then go, well, zero, one, two, three uh, should give me the asterisk. And so I've gone... Um, one down and three across. Uh, and so here I've actually been using an array of strings 
as my two-dimensional data because it happened to be character data I was wanting to use. So there's lots of kind of interesting ways that we can use this in all sorts of different things. Okay, that's possibly enough on arrays. Uh, let's talk a little bit about objects. And the place I want to start on this is that, um, well, when I had my days array, days, and I would give it a numeric key, days of two, days with the key two gave me the value Tuesday. And so it was mapping numbers to values. Sometimes we might want to map strings to values. And so this is my entry into how objects uh, work in JavaScript. Uh, so let me do this here. And so literally define a, um, a JavaScript object, my data. And I've said that in this uh, object, the field name has the value Aldenon Moncrief. The field status, fictional, the field book, the importance of being earnest. And I can now look this up as if it was mapping strings to values. My data of the string name, if the key is the string name, then the value is Algernon Moncrief. I can also use dot notation for it. I can say my data dot name and it comes out Algernon Moncrief. Uh, one of the usefulnesses of being able to do this with strings uh, is I can uh, do something like I can put spaces in my string if I use the angle brackets that I wouldn't be able to do in the dot brackets because it just wouldn't pass. I can say, you know, personal greeting uh, is yo. And so now if I look at my data, here it is, this thing that has personal greeting. Uh, but we'll see that my data, well, I can't say dot personal greeting because, uh, hang on, unexpected syntax error because that space. But I can say my data of personal greeting. Um, now, you might have come across the term JSON before. JSON is a format that sometimes people uh, write data files in. And what it literally stands for is, uh, so JSON is JavaScript object notation. And so this is to do with how you define objects, because if I wanted, I could actually have said my data equals, and I could have put those bits at the beginning in quotes, name Algernon Moncrief. Status fictional. Uh, let's put the personal greeting in. And because it's in quotes, I can put the personal greeting in as a key. Uh, yo. And uh, the book, uh, which doesn't say yo, I, I've made that part up. <laughs> the importance of being earnest. And so that has defined it. So this is this JSON format, and it is a way of defining JavaScript objects. It's the, the, the format JavaScript object, uh, JavaScript object notation. Um, and so there enough, sure enough, I can still go my data dot name, and I can get Algernon Moncrief. I can go my data uh, of personal greeting and get yo. OK, let's keep going. Now, previously, we saw C style for loops that gave us a, a special notation for arrays. And so that had that for of. There is also a special for loop uh, for objects as well, and it will give you the keys in an object. Um, so what I could do is I could go for uh, const key in my data. And then what I'm going to do, and let's use one of those template literals, console.log of backtick and let's just put the property name um, with apologies I need to fix up the slide that should say key here that should say key here I'll go and fix that afterwards um, because key is what I've set that variable to um, so what I would like to say is that the key has the value my data of key. And then let's run that. And so that has now looped through all of the string keys in this object 
and for each of those string keys it's printed out a line where I've printed out the key and I've then looked up the value for that key and so that's what that one is doing. Um, now JavaScript weekly typed lots of curious behaviors let's introduce you to a couple of its curious behaviors. Um, we talked about arrays and objects the funny thing in JavaScript is that arrays are also objects and so one of the things that means is that I could set a value for a non-string key. So let me go back and let me do my day, uh, my uh, days array here. And so there is my days array with keys 0 to 6, all numbers uh, working all very nicely. And then I'd go and say days of year as a string uh, is 365 because that's how many days there are in a non-leap year. And it's happy with it. And now if I print out, uh, get it to evaluate that array, we'll see that days, where well, it's an array and it's got all of these numeric keys, but it's also got this string key um, that has a number in it. Um, so I have been able to add um, something for a non-numeric key into this array. And that is a peculiar quirk of how JavaScript does its arrays. Um, now, it's not a very good idea to make use of that. Um, but let's just tell you how it behaves. Um, so the string and the number keys can be retrieved using a for in loop. So if I go for const key in days, and I would like to go console.log of key, and I print them out, then it will print out those keys 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, year. If I wanted to iterate over it using a for of loop, well, it's still an array. And so the ones I'm going to get are the ones that have numeric keys. So if I go for const um, day of days and I was to go console dot log of day. Then you'll see I get Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't get 365. Uh, because 365 was not one of the ones that had this number key. It, it's not in the iterable stuff. It is just another property that has been set on the array because arrays are also objects. Um, OK, what if I was to assign one with a string that actually looked like a number? Uh, well, in that case, if I was to go days of the string 8 is octoday, then if I have a look at days, we can see that the key, uh, well, it's actually being converted successfully to a number. Uh, so actually, that one is now against the number eight. And if I was to go uh, for day of days, octoday uh, does appear. Uh, I'm also getting this curious undefined going on, which is going to be to do with that, um, uh, to do with that uh, curious element uh, in there. Um, if I was to go for day in days and print out the keys, you'll see that we now get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 8 year. Uh, I've, I've not got 7. Oh, sorry. Yes. So that is why there is an undefined here. Sorry, I tripped myself up in, in the description. Um, so when I did this, uh, I momentarily forgot that, of course, days, the previous last element was days of 6. And I've just set days of 8. And so what does it do in the array? Well, it has to set days of 8. And its last one is days of six. And so days of seven becomes undefined. It's suddenly uh, in there, but undefined. Uh, but it won't come out when I have a look at it, a look at the key. But if I go days of seven, undefined. And if I go days dot length, we will see that the length is now nine. The last element was eight. And so there must be nine of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so many apologies for tripping over my uh, explanation to, 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 to start with because I'd, I'd not paid attention to the fact that I'd said days of eight instead of days of seven. All right, let's keep going. Now, functions. One of the curious things is that functions in JavaScript also derive from object. And this means that on functions, we can also set properties. So let me define the function twice of i. And let me say that this returns two times whatever i is. OK, 
So now I have, I can call twice two, but I also have twice, which is an object. And I can get it to evaluate it and show, yep, it's this, this function that's got uh, this particular text in it. Uh, but I can also do things like say, well, twice, I would like to set the property status on this function to be the value being tested. And so now if I go twice dot status, it will tell me being tested. So I've been able to treat this function um, as an object and I've been able to refer to properties of it. Um, now, that also means, of course, that twice uh, square brackets quote status is a little different than twice round brackets status. Round brackets is going to complain, well, hang on, I can't multiply a string by two. What are you talking about? Uh, twice round brackets two is going to be four, but twice of two is going to be undefined because it's going to be trying to look up um, that as if, as if there was uh, something assigned with the key of two in it. Um, there are some properties that you can't modify. So if I was to say twice dot name is Algernon. OK, happy with that. You set the, the twice dot name properly. If I ask it, what what is the name of twice? It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> the name of twice is twice uh, because name here is one of these pseudo properties that actually refers to the name of the function because this is a named function that I defined by saying function twice such and such rather than saying let twice equal and defining an anonymous um, arrow function, uh, which I might do like this. Uh, oops, hang on. Uh, oh, in that case. And so in that case, twice arrow um, dot name. Oh, it has actually managed to get twice arrow dot name. OK, many apologies. I tripped myself. I should have tested that beforehand. Even if I set it as an arrow function, uh, it is managing to get the um, the fact that I said, no, no, no this is twice arrow uh, out of it. So there's a few things to be careful of um, there in terms of if you start treating functions like ob objects and start setting things on them. Well, they've also got these other aspects to them and it's quite easy to make a mistake even if you've been doing this for, uh, for a while. Um, there are a few libraries that do actually um, or at least have in the past relied on the idea that you will define a function you will set some properties on that function that the library will use in various different ways um, but yeah just be a little bit careful over it. Uh, in JavaScript there is this curiosity that arrays are also objects and functions are also objects um, but be careful if you start trying to trying to take advantage of that feature. OK, enough about those sorts of warnings. Let's go to something that uh, you might want to do. And for this one, let me open up and let me go about blank. And let me give myself a blank page and let me go Control Shift I and open a console. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an event handler. And this is my introduction to the, the idea of passing functions around as values, because I think this is one is a little bit more intuitive than some others you might come across. So later on, we'll meet HTML. For the moment, I'm not going to introduce the HTML syntax, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and add a button into that blank page. Uh, so let me just get the document and let's just go, well, I'm going to cheat and I'm just going to say init HTML equals um, div and give me an empty div. All right, so let's just to check that's working. Let me clear that out of the way. Don't worry about that. Um, um, let me now go let be document create me a button. Okay, so B now has in it, well, document create element has defined a button for me. And so B, it's got a button in it. I'm not worried about the HTML. I just now know that B is a reference to an object that is a button. I haven't put the button into the document yet. Document in the body, let me now append my button. And over here, gosh, isn't it small? Uh, that little button has appeared. I tell you what, let us make that button have some text by defining uh, an inner text property. On that button. So let me say that the inner text, sorry, setting the inner, um, 
the inner text property on the button. Uh, so this isn't HTML, this is me programmatically asking the browser to put a button on the screen. And let's say that this is my button. So now over here, I have a button that says this is my button. Click it, nothing happens. It's just a button. I just asked, I just got the programmed the document to say, put me a button on the screen. There it is. I'd like something to happen when that button is pressed. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an event handler. And so B refers to my button. So if I type B, it's highlighting my button for me. And now I'm going to say on the click, and I'm going to set the on click property to be, in this case, an arrow function. I'm going to say, well, when you're clicked, I would like you to, to do this function that accepts the event of the button click. And then when it's when that event happens, I just want you to print out console.log. I was clicked. So now I have set a property on B. I have set that property to take the value this particular function. And now when I click that button, it prints out I was clicked. There it is. I was clicked. So by setting that property that's a function, well, the browser, when I click that button, it knows to go and look up the on click property and then it finds a function and it knows to call that function passing it the event. Um, this can be quite useful. There can be lots of different sorts of events I might want to respond to. Let me now go let I is document dot create element and let me create an input element. This is going to create a little text input. It's what it'll defo default to. Um, I've got my element, uh, but I've not added it into the document yet. Let me go document, get the body property of the document, which is a, an, another object and it, and it has methods on it. And let me now call the append method on the document body and let me append my, my input. Bing, here we go. I now have my input sitting over here. Now let me set an event handler on that input. And so let me go i dot, and let's go on change is going to, and well, when an event comes in, what I would like to do is I would like to uh, console dot log, that event is going to have a property called target, which will be the, the, the object on the page that it was triggered from. So it'll be this input because I'm saying when this input changes, and so that'll trigger an event whose uh, target is this input, um, then I'd like to get the event target, which is this input, and I would like to get uh, the value property from this input. OK, now I do some typing in here. Hello, my name is Will. And we'll notice we haven't triggered any events yet. That's because the change property, uh, sorry, the change event, the on change event for inputs happens kind of when I finish typing and I leave the focus of that input. So when I commit the value by leaving the focus and click elsewhere, ding, it triggered the event. Hello, my name is Will. Just got printed out. My event handler got triggered. On the other hand, maybe I would like to do something every single time the text inside that input changes while you're still typing and you haven't committed the behavior, uh, committed the change by leaving the field. Uh, and so in that case, let me go I dot on input and let me put that to the event handler that goes, well, I would like to um, let S is equal to event target, so this input and its value. And what I'd actually like to do is go console.log s dot to uppercase. And so now I've set two properties. I've set the on change property and I've set the on input property and I've set them both to event handlers. And so that is going to interact with how the page works. And when those events happen, it's going to know to call my event handlers. And so now as I 
delete characters, it keeps printing it out in uppercase every time I type into the field or delete the characters or hello, my name is Algernon. And um, as soon as I click out of it, the other event ha handler will happen. And so we'll still see um, that one printing it out in lowercase because the one that I said for on change when the value is committed just printed it out as it was. Whereas the one that I said for when I'm doing the typing, I've asked it to print it out in uppercase. So that is my very brief introduction to this idea of event handlers that we will see uh, in lots of different uh, scenarios. And as, as we uh, as we do more programming and kind of get more experience with it, not necessarily in this course, but more generally as programmers. Um, popping back to the slides then. Uh, so that's a little bit of a description of what we were doing just then that I showed you um, in the video. Um, and this is the one uh, with the inputs and doing it in uppercase. The last thing I'd kind of leave it with, with you, though, is so far when we've been writing our robots, when we've been making Snowbot behave, we've done it as a sequ sequential program. We've said there is this block of code that is Snowbot's program. Just execute that. However, as things go on, you might find that actually what you want to do is track the state of different objects and things might want to behave differently depending on what state they're in and what events are happening. And so you might start getting seeing things that are a little, little bit more complicated. Now, I'm not going to sh show you this directly in this video because I think this video has already got too long. Um, but if I was to pop back to the beginning here, uh, we can already start seeing a few state changes and behaviors. So while I'm writing this, well, the state of the blob guard has, you know, moving right and now it's moving down. Um, the state of this gate over here, it's closed waiting for a diamond, but now actually it's open. Um, Snowbot moving there and now his state is that he's at the goal. Lots of items in programs behave differently depending on what, their state, what state they're in. And they can also sometimes want to have event handlers that will react to particular events. So, for instance, not in this game, but you could imagine a game where actually the guard has a, um, a cone of vision and wants to do something when he sees Snowbot. And so maybe there's a when you see something uh, event that goes on in that sort of a game. Uh, so that's my little bit of a segue to the idea that um, as soon as we have this idea that we can have um, functions as values and we can have events and we can change variables to show things in different states, uh, we can start expressing uh, rather more complex programs than just sequential series of actions. Um, but I think this is quite long enough and I should sign off there.